the seeking group. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Smith, Dr. Willis, and Dr. Ian Kim for helping me put this together. So here are our objectives. We're going to kind of discuss the history and how we got here. What is pain? What is addiction? Who is the seeking patient? And then how do we handle and how do we deal with these patients? So first, how did we get here? So it was previously thought that there was just this nationwide problem with the underassessment and the undertreatment of pain. In 1990, Dr. Mitchell Max, he was the president of the American Pain Society, um, and he wrote an uh, editorial in the Annals of Internal Medicine. He describes how pain was being inadequately treated and that physicians were not being held accountable for this. And it was throughout the system. It was in ERs, it was in the post-op setting, it was inpatient, and that he thought that one of the problems is that pain isn't visible. You know, it's not like the vital signs on the chart and there wasn't a scale established, and there was no way for patients to quantify their pain in a standardized manner. So in 1999, California's legislature passed a bill that pain needs to be assessed at the start of every single visit. It's along with the other vital signs. And not only that, but it needs to be noted in the chart similar to our vital signs. And this thus was born the phrase, the fifth vital sign. It stated that every health facility licensed pursuant to this chapter shall, as a condition of licensure, include pain as an item to be assessed at the same time as vital signs are taken. The pain assessment shall be noted in the patient's chart in a manner consistent with other vital signs. Eventually, this spread nationwide. But it wasn't just about establishing a standardized approach to measuring pain. Pain became something that people thought could and should be eliminated by whatever means were necessary. October 31st, the year 2000, Congress passed a bill that established the Decade of Pain Control and Research. In 2001, the Joint Commission um, published some standards to help with this perceived problem of inadequate pain treatment. And initially, this kind of seemed like a victory, um, particularly patients in the PACU, maybe end-of-life situations where pain was pretty significant. Um, but a lot of other doctors, they were pretty skeptical. Those who criticized it were actually deemed opioid-phobic. And one article said that pain had become the enemy that needed to be eradicated. It was the patient's right to be free of pain. Mm -hmm. So the other kind of interesting rule to this was that it was kind of established that patients rating their pain at a 4 or higher on a scale of 1 to 10 couldn't be discharged. This was kind of just an arbitrary choice that they made, the number 4. Um, so, you know, if someone was at their outpatient nutrition appointment or, you know, something like that, and they had to have their vital signs assessed, and they had to have, of course, their pain number assessed, and it was a 5 from their chronic arthritis, they were potentially going to be sent to the ER or some other facility to deal with this pain. But there's another side to this story. It's not just that pain is the enemy, but it's the concept that pain medications are universally safe. So if we go back to Dr. Max, he's the guy that helped to spearhead this concept of the fifth vital sign. And he and many others, as they were creating this concept, they cited a letter, and the letter was entitled, Addiction Rare in Patients Treated with Narcotics. It's about eight lines, that's it. It was in the January 1980 uh, New England Journal of Medicine, and it said, um, we conclude that despite widespread use of narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. It, kind of mentions two studies, it doesn't really give any details. Like I said, it was in total about eight lines. So uh, the Joint Commission publishes a book in the year 2000 that doctors could purchase for their required CME uh, seminars, and it cited studies saying that there is no evidence that addiction is a significant issue when persons are given opioids for pain control. Uh, 
this book, by the way, was sponsored by a narcotics manufacturer. <laughs> um, I'm not sure which one. I, I saw it, and now I don't remember which one it was. There was also significant pressure from pharmaceutical companies to, uh, to increase the use of opioids despite a lack of evidence as to the effect of efficacy in non-cancer patients. Remember that most opioids were initially tested uh, as being effective in cancer patients. Um, the FDA actually approved the labeling saying that iatrogenic addiction was very rare. Um, and <coughs> that using delayed absorption medications like OxyContin reduced the abuse liability of drug. This was then spread out in a widespread marketing campaigns to physicians across the country. So OxyContin in particular was kind of interesting. It was marketed to physicians in rural areas especially, and it was initially thought that it was undesirable to addicts because of its time-release coding. But what happened was, because of the time release, they actually made it in much higher doses. Um, it was the idea that they were supposed to get this long, smooth kind of pain control. Um, but instead, people began to crush the medication and snort it or inject it. And because it was so well marketed to these rural areas, it became known as hillbilly heroin. In 2003, the FDA cited the makers of OxyContin for misleading promotional ads to physicians that underplayed these addictive risks. And in 2007, three of their executives actually pled guilty to charges of misleading the public. So, you know, they tried to rectify some of these situations, but by this point, this concept that iatrogenic addiction was rare and that long-acting opioids were less, addi had less addictive, it had been out there for years. So, now we kind of have this perfect storm. We have this concept that pain is the enemy, it needs to be eradicated. We have drug companies that are publishing dubious information about the safety of medications. We have the FDA buying into this concept that opioids are safe. And then we have widespread distribution of this information to the public. It doesn't take long for things to really unravel. Uh, in 2017, the Joint Commission published an article. It was called The Joint Commission's Pain Standards, Origins, and Evolution. And this is a chart from the article shows the number of opioid prescriptions filled from 1991 to 2013. And I want you to realize that that scale on the y-axis, that is in millions of prescriptions. So in 1991, we went from 76 million opioid prescriptions to uh, 219 in 2011. It's almost a three-fold increase. And like I said, in millions. And so the 90s, the 2000s, the first wave of this addiction epidemic as the prescriptions increase and the availability of opioids increases. By 2010, you know, the addiction is out there and it's established. And even though at this point there are attempts to curb the damage, it's really, it's too little, too late. Um, there's a push to decrease the number of narcotic prescriptions, but of course people inevitably, they develop workarounds. Um, so in the 20 teens, heroin and illicitly manufactured synthetic opioids like fentanyl like skyrockets, and so does the death count. Now the numbers they do vary by state. Uh, this map it's from 2017 from the CDC website, and the key in the lower corner shows the death rate per 100,000 people. Um, the highest rate in West Virginia is 57.8 per 100,000. Um, it's followed by Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. New York is kind of in the middle of the pack. It's around 19.4 deaths per 100,000. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea of the raw numbers, uh, Pennsylvania had 5,388 deaths due to drug overdoses in 2017. Now, these, oh, that's sepsis. <laughs> Not all of these, this is not exclusively limited to opioids, but I think we all have realized that a large portion of this stems from the opioid epidemic. Um, 
The Secretary of the Health and Human Services, Tom Price, said, we lose a Vietnam War in every single year to drug overdoses. Um, there are some legislative responses that have resulted from these really scary statistics. Um, in 2016, Massachusetts became the first state to limit first-time opioid prescriptions to seven days. And currently there are 15 states that do this, including New York, California, Colorado. Um, and these are limiting the prescription to seven days for acute pain in opiate-naive patients. So essentially, that should be most of our ER patients. Arizona, Arizona, North Carolina, New Jersey actually limit it to five days. Um, you know, these laws are new, so there's really no data yet to show whether they are effective or not. So, we're going to move on kind of from this background information and discuss a little bit more of what is pain. It's, it's a complex pathway. We all learned about it in medical school. I'm not really going to belabor this point because it's a lecture unto itself. But just briefly, nociception is the process by which information about actual tissue damage or perceived tissue damage is related to the brain. So the nociceptors are activated peripherally. The stimulus is transduced along the axons, the peripheral nerves, to the dorsal horn of the spine, relayed up the spinal cord through the spinal thalamic tract um, to output on the thalamus at the ventral posterior lateral nucleus and the ventromedial nucleus. The thalamus kind of functions as your relay station for sensory information to go to the cerebral cortex. And then information is relayed to cortical and subcortical regions like the amygdala, amygdala hypothalamus, periaqueductal gray matter, basal ganglia, and regions of the cerebral cortex. Most notably, the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex are consistently activated when nociceptors are stimulated by noxious stimuli, and activation in these brain regions is associated with the subjective experience of pain. So, in truth, pain is much more than just a biological pathway. Psychological factors interact with physiology to modulate the experience of pain. We zoom in on the upper corner of that last slide I showed you. You'll see these four boxes with cognitive appraisal, emotional reaction, behavioral response, attention to pain. And each of these is a complex portion of the pain response. So you can say that pain is psychophysiological. It's a complex interplay between neurological pathways and psychological interpretation. And this is what makes pain so difficult to understand because there's a psychological and subjective aspect that's impossible to measure and it's different for each individual. So the science of addiction, again, it's, it's complicated. It's not completely understood. It varies depending on the substance involved. We're not gonna go through all the details. The main concept is the mesolimbic reward pathway, though there are likely other pathways that are also involved. Basic idea is that dopaminergic neurons are usually under inhibition, probably by GABA, and then via various routes, substance of addiction lead to increases in dopamine, which then causes positive reinforcement. So most uppers like cocaine, amphetamines, nicotine, they exert their effects by increasing the synaptic levels of dopamine, norepi, and epi. Sedatives like benzos, alcohol, barbiturates, they increase levels of GABA, but the long-term reinforcement pathway of sedatives likely has to do with our endogenous opioid system, which in turn includes the dopamine pathway. And then lastly, opioids, they bind the opiate receptors, uh, particularly in the nucleus accumbens, which then sends a signal to release more dopamine. So there's also the concept of pseudo-addiction. Um, and this is where patients have real pain, but they might exaggerate their claims of pain in order to receive more medication. And they think this might stem from times that their pain was very real and not adequately treated, and this, this fear that pain will recur. And typically, pseudo-addiction will resolve when the pain or the illness resolves, if the pain or the illness resolves. So here are some of our commonly prescribed or over-the-counter drugs of abuse. Um, 
you know, it's more than just opioids and benzos, so they are the classically the most common barbiturates, um, but they have become less common as they are prescribed less frequently. Um, second generation antipsychotics, in particular quetiapine, it has a calming sedative effect and people often use it in combination with another prescription or street drug. Of course, uh, your ADHD medications, which are related to amphetamines, dextromethorphan in over-the-counter cough medications seems to have multiple mechanisms of action, but essentially it acts as a dissociative anesthetic. Um, loperamide, uh, or Imodium, uh, it's an intestinal mu opioid receptor agonist, but it seems if it's taken in large enough doses, it will hit receptors outside of the GI tract. Um, Benadryl, we know it causes sedation, but when given an IV push, it can give this rush of euphoria, especially if given in combination with other medications of abuse. I think we probably have all had those patients that ask for their pain meds with any push of Benadryl. Um, honestly, there, there are probably innumerable more. Um, most meds, if taken in the wrong form or at the wrong dose or with a combination of other medicines, they all seem to likely have some sort of abuse potential. So, as far as who can be a CD patient, the short answer is everyone. Um, prescription drug abuse affects all ages, ethnicities, all genders, all socioeconomic levels. And this is what makes it so incredibly difficult to identify people at risk, because everyone really is at risk. So is there anything objective? You know, I did a lot of kind of reading, Googling for this, and you will find a decent amount of information, but honestly I felt like most of it didn't show, say anything really of use. Um, they talk about how to identify the seeking patient, but really very little objective or statistically supported findings. Uh, not only that, but the risk factors as we typically think of them aren't really very reliable. A lot of opinion type pieces, but very few actual scientific articles. I did find a couple, um, but to be frank, I didn't think they were very good. One of them here is how frequently are classic drug seeking behaviors used by drug seeking patients in the emergency department. And it used this retrospective chart review where they basically had patients that were already enrolled in a case management program at the hospital and they were enrolled, enrolled because they were um, concerned that they had, you know, they had been referred to chemical dependency program or they had this care plan limiting the use of addictive prescription medications. And they went through those patients um, who had shown up to the emergency department and they looked for these classic behaviors. So, what really stood out to me of this is that they just assumed that anyone who was in this, uh, this uh, case management program was only coming to the hospital to be seeking pain medication as opposed to for any other reason. So that was their comparison cohort. Um, and this was the list of classic behaviors that they looked at. I think you can probably imagine this no surprise that there's low sensitivity and specificity, and I thought the list was actually kind of ridiculous anecdotally because I think a lot of our patients, most of our patients maybe even have this. And like I said before, you know, what are they comparing this to? They're basically assuming that everyone who was in that case management program was only there for intoxication. Second article was really quite similar, again, comparing classic red flags for seeking behavior in those who are enrolled in a case management program. Uh, retrospective chart review on 100 and 152 drug-seeking patients. Once again, it was just 152 people that were in these case man care management programs. Um, Similar risk factors to what we saw on that last slide, non-narcotic allergies, requesting addictive medications by name, requesting medication refills, reporting lost or stolen meds, three plus visits to the ED complaining of pain in different body parts, 10 out of 10 pain, greater than 10 out of 10 pain, um, and three plus ED visits within the past seven days, requesting parental meds, 
or having a chief complaint of headache, back pain, or dental pain. Um, again, so many of our patients. The only concrete data they actually gave was the odds ratio, and there were really no other figures. Like I said, not the strongest studies. Um, on the flip side, though, I found a study from 2017 that looked to establish if physicians were stigmatizing patients as drug-seeking and then changing their management uh, because they asked for specific meds. So, so they showed 192 primary care physicians a series of video vignettes, and it was patients that presented with back pain. And then the doctors were randomly assigned to watch a vignette where they just were asking for general help with their back pain, or a vignette where the patient said, you know, said something along the lines of, you know, oh, I found my spouse's um, oxycodone uh, in the in the medicine cabinet. It was left over from an old dental procedure, and I took one last night, and wow, the, you know, the pain was gone. That really, really worked. And then the main outcome was looking if the physician put drug seeking down as a potential diagnosis. And the patients that mentioned specifically the oxycodone, 21% of physicians said that they were potentially there as drug seekers, and um, as compared to just 3% for those who were looking for the general health of the back pain. Um, you know, I think it's not the perfect study. Um, but, you know, it's a fictional action, uh, interaction of patients requesting these opioids by name. But I thought the paper kind of made a nice point with this quote as far as kind of establishing where we are as physicians in curbing the drug, drug epidemic. It says, uh, developing approaches to improve pain treatment without contributing to misuse of narcotic medications will require insights into the thought processes physicians employ when encountering different patients presenting with pain. How physicians make clinical decisions about prescribing pain medications, how they respond to patient requests for pain medications, and how they manage the risk of abuse or diversion of narcotic medications are not well understood. So, in my humble opinion, you, you have to be your own detective. There's not going to be a scoring system or objective calculator that you can reliably use in the ER. You know, does it feel like you're being scammed? Are you just getting a little too much pressure for a particular medication? A lot of it, frankly, is going to be gut instinct. instinct. Um, you know, maybe they always come in the middle of the night when you can't call their pharmacy to see if they picked up that Percocet prescription, or you, you can't call their doctor to get some corroborating information. Um, I think you should always ask what their Tylenol and Motrin allergy actually is. And you have to do, you have to use your doorway exam. You know, some people are very stoic, they aren't going to show a lot of uh, signs of pain, but, you know, if you're sitting at the computer and people are laughing and having Popeyes and talking on the phone, you know, it's, it's something to keep in mind. I also think one of the biggest things for me is if a patient is asking for meds for if they're asking for a diagnosis. You know, they keep coming back with their pain, but their main focus isn't get rid of the pain or give me meds, it's why am I having this, what is going on? Um, and I think these are really the ones to be particularly wary of. Um, you know, what are we missing? I had kind of a similar situation a couple days ago with some of this vague neck, headache, arm pain. It was like her third visit, so we decided to scan her. It was like an early superior vena cava syndrome from an undiagnosed mass. So what do we do with these patients? Um, we don't have the luxury of time in the ED. It's really not realistic to have pain contracts or do random drug screens, pill counts, these lengthy pain surveys. You should be checking the state database for prescriptions, um, but be aware that especially in this region, um, People can easily and will cross state lines, and every state has its own unique system. Also, I didn't realize that not all of these registries take into account prescriptions from like the VA or some of the online refill services. But the data is still useful. There was a study that said that um, ED providers changed their mind about writing prescriptions about 10% of the time after they had looked at the uh, state database. You know, Deciding to give opioids or controlled substances is an individual decision for each provider. 
Some people, um, they don't give narcotics at all. Some will only give it if they have a diagnosis of cancer or surgical abdomen. Um, you know, I think these blanket statements are probably a little bit too black and white, and it probably needs to be on more of a case-by-case -case basis to, to weigh the risks of under-treating pain versus encouraging medication abuse. Remember that you know, addiction is a chronic brain disease. It's, it's an illness to itself, and it's, it's a terrible disease. And we do need to kind of be aware of that. As far as documentation, a lot of what I read um, talked about the importance of writing down that someone was seeking in the chart. And I don't necessarily disagree with this, but I think people have to be wary about doing this and realize the downstream effect that you are maybe causing. You know, especially if it's someone that hasn't been fully worked up for something. Maybe the person hasn't has been caught, had the pain for months and months, but they haven't actually had uh, the MRI they need or some other outpatient test. And so if you go ahead and label them as seeking, is that going to affect their care down the line? Especially when you think of so many of our patients that don't have reliable access to a physician, or maybe they've just moved up from the, from the island or something, and then you automatically label them as a seeker. Uh, for our future providers to see. I think what's probably better is that you document actions and quotes and then let the downstream physician utilize that objective information. So if there's a pattern or certain behaviors in the chart, then people can use that in the context of the current visit and make their own decisions about the patient's motivation. Um, Kind of a side note um, that we're not going to go into much, but I just want to remind everyone also that you know if someone has a history of addiction or substance abuse, but obvious painful pathology, you know it's someone in CCT, it was a head struck and they have an open tip head fracture and root fractures. You know you should not be withholding pain medication because of their history of substance abuse in these types of situations. So how do we deal with this? This is, this is the real dilemma for us as physicians, because there's two sides to the story. The, we need to be tough and crack down on addiction, and then the, we need to treat and believe the patient first side. And then, of course, there's all these shades in between. There's also, a, for some systems, a monetary component. You know, some people say that pain control can be used as a measure of patient satisfaction, which can be linked to uh, reimbursement. But what I think is probably, it's best to come up with a standardized approach to telling someone, telling a patient that you aren't going to give him or her opioids for their pain. It's good to establish this early and then curb their expectations. Um, remember though, if you do set clear boundaries, which you should, uh, many patients are going to seem to respond pretty poorly to this. Uh, it's okay. It's kind of part of the process, but you should be ready, you should be aware. They might become aggressive or angry, they might insult you, you know, we've all kind of seen it before. And patients can be very manipulative and they, they know how to get to you and they know how to get under your skin. So here we have um, stages of change, some of you have probably seen it before. And most of our patients that are in that doctor shopping, going to multiple EDs, they're in this pre-contemplation phase at the, at the top. And in that stage, they, they don't want to talk about change, they're not ready for change, they really, they just, they're focused on getting the substance. And frankly, the only thing you can do is just say no. Um, it's kind of this hope that by doing that enough times, it will make them uncomfortable, and hopefully with enough uncomfortable interactions, um, eventually they're going to start to think about what they're doing, and then enter that next contemplation stage. Great. 
supers. Well, think of the, the surrogate patients who are really in demands to be seen, by the way, in the demands of, of medications. Think of the patient who's having an emergency room and he's complaining of severe renal colic. Maybe you're thinking he's got a kidney stone. You get a urinalysis and there's blood in the urine, but the doctor knows and, and suspects that perhaps the patient pricked his finger because the blood is clotted. Often they'll come in and they'll say, give us excuses like, I left my pills in a motel or I lost my med flushed my medicine down the toilet or, um, you know, I, my dog ate my medicine. Something we hear all the time. <laughs> so we have to determine the thing. <laughs> we have to, to uh, consider and look for certain features that are consistent with a drug seeker. Many times they are very assertive and pushy. Uh, many times they they um, will only ask for a certain kind of pain medication and won't listen to any alternatives. Others come in and they're manipulative. They tell me, "Doctor, you're awesome, man. Or you're like uh, the best doctor in town, man." Thinking that I'm going to give in. A lot of them have at the end of the day, thinking that you're trying to get out of the office and that you're going to give in and give them whatever they want. If we decide to accept the patient and start them on an opioid regimen, we have to consider the risk of doing so. You have to follow state and federal guidelines and use careful documentation. You've got to consider the potential for drug tolerance when designing the regimen. You've got to provide education about safety, provide informed consent. You've got to set realistic goals and document uh, progress. And many times, at the patient's first visit, we prescribe only enough medication to allow them to obtain records from their previous treaters. If I'm not comfortable prescribing the medications, I simply tell them that I'm going to refer them to somebody who does this uh, as a specialty. The takeaway in this case is if you're going to prescribe these medications, you have to do so diligently. You have to monitor these patients. You have to act compassionately, and you have to consider that uh, these patients require dignity. Above all, you have to document all your efforts to, to uh, implement all of these strategies.
Okay, let the residents deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. That was the best thing that happened in New York State. <laughs> no one has access to it. No one has access to it. Yeah. I've heard their eye, their eye stop out for them. They say, this is the pill you've gotten in the last six months. Oh, that's it's a good. long, 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 long stack. Yeah. I was like, you've gotten a ton of medicine over the last six months. Just like confront them with the actual information that yeah, you have. This is what you this is what you picked up in the drugstore. Yeah. It's got forty lines of pills. I don't usually print it out, but I usually I usually I like mention that. Too, I, 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 I like that. I usually do mention the eye stop and I check I do check it all the time for that reason. And I like to mention to like be like, hey, you know, the government's been tracking all this and they have record of everything. <laughs> <laughs> they know what you're doing. Like you know, like we 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 can figure out exactly what's going on and like this is what I see um, and I don't say like oh you know I don't feel comfortable I'm just going to refer you to somebody else because it's kind of like oh I'm just pushing you away to somebody else so I, don't, I didn't like that, that particular line of how he says it but I do mention like look these, these are things that a specialist really needs to control your pain this is the emergency room maybe not be the best place to do this they just try to start the culture of the emergency room isn't the place to find these answers we have to find it with someone who's going to actually sit down with you really make a plan like like the video was saying. Because that's what we really need to do. We have long, long term plans to help our patients with these things. I actually call them because the Ozaki gave us the number to the pain specialist and they say we call we can't get an appointment. I just call them and make it for them. And then they don't have that excuse anymore. What about a county? How good is our It's still, it's not, it's not, there's not a quick referral, like, that's the, that's one of our, our big troubles. But you know, like, it, it's still difficult because we're seeing a lot of the patients, and our patients should be having other primary care doctors that they can follow up with to help with this process, and, and the other doctors that they see. And a lot of times, if you look at the patients who are supposed to be following up in our clinics, or our primary care clinics, or whatever, you'll see that they, they haven't visited those doctors in a long time. And I'll ask them too, like, hey, when was the last time you saw this doctor? And like, oh, I'm not sure. And they'll say, oh, you want to check the computer and it's been two years. So what's the problem? Like, you got to make an appointment there too because that's someone who needs to help out. Um, so it, so it, it, it's, there, we do not have as easy a process to refer to pain management here. Um, but also the, the patients are sometimes, when you question, how come you haven't seen any of your other appointments? And they say, ah, oh, you know, I just haven't been around to do it. I, you know, I forgot. So it's a big barrier that we have to overcome. But even even just having that rapid referral might not be enough to um, to get a, a patient ready to go into. Uh, something I try to do too, and it kind of couples in a little bit with uh, what the rest of the people are saying is I try to go talk to the patient before doing the chart review or I stop. Uh, and what I find that does is it, it doesn't bias you up front. So. And, some, and you, you get that feeling when you might have a patient who, who may be drug seeking and you may have that concern. And then try to talk to them for a little bit. Um, try to get details. So ask them about, oh, so when, when do you follow up? When do you do this? What medications do you take at home? When was the last time you had a prescription? And it, it's a little dirty because it is a little entrapment because then I take all of that information and then I go do, do the eye stop. I go check the chart. And honestly, if, if they're lying to me, or if I catch them in a lie, and it, it might, you know, it's not absolute if they forgot or whatever, but I'll, I'll then confront them with that information. Um, and then sometimes that can, it's an easy way to bring the conversation to, you know, what, why aren't you doing the things that you're supposed to be doing? Uh, but it's difficult when you come with that information already, because you're already coming in with that bias, and you're already going, you're, you're like ready with that, aha! Like moment where you can develop a relationship with them and then you come back to them, uh, and that's been effective. It also when it's when you're invariably going to get into that tough situation with the patient, you've kind of already had that pre-session where you've showed that you kind of cared about them, and then you can kind, of kind of pivot uh, then and say like, you know what, I've done my best. You're, we're, we're moving on now, and you just say no. I have two strategies that have worked really well for me, and the first one is when the patient keeps asking for more and more pain medicine, um, I explain to them that we try to achieve a balance between 
helping to treat your pain, but also not stopping the function of your vital organs and your breathing and your dying. And so I, I explained to them that, you know, I can give you a bunch of pain medicine and put you to sleep, but that doesn't do anything for you because as soon as you wake up, you're going to have pain again. So we have to create realistic expectations for what's the level of pain we want to get to so that you can go home because you can't take these medicines at home and put yourself to sleep at home in a non-monitored environment. And then the other thing I tell them is um, when I give them a medication and they go, oh, it didn't work, I need more Dilaudid or I need more morphine because the first dose you gave me didn't work, I ask them, why would you want me to give you more of a medication that didn't work to control your pain? Um, I don't understand how that's going to help if we just keep throwing medication at you that's not actually working to control your pain. We need to try something else. And usually that kind of ends the argument of give me more of whatever I'm asking for. We have alternatives now that have been shown to work, like for gastroparesis cases or these like abdominal pain or vomit cases, um, where people are specifically asking for morphine. I've had patients who've done really well in Haldol, mm -hmm. and I've had patients who asked for Haldol for their abdominals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've had that too. Okay. Forgive me if they're going to speak more about this, but I think um, we as a program, we can do also a better job at high harm reduction. And all, all these patients that we're talking about, we know are in chronic opioid um, therapy, they should all get a, a, an awesome prescription and, and, and be at least mention how to use it because that can actually save a life or at least save a life to somebody that they know that has an overdose. And we have that downstate, right? The kids. Yeah, kids. Not, not a county. But at uh, county, we have the peer counselors, which we should start to use. Yep. Mm -hmm. specialists that are there for a lot of weekdays, daytime, so take advantage of that. Alright, so moving forward, touching on what Tom just said, you know, we have alternatives to opioids. It's not just opioids, Tylenol, and Motrin. Use that. You know, we have pain dose ketamine, gabapentin, you can do nerve blocks. All these things are available to us in the ER. Try and help facilitate that referral to PT or pain management or the other services that can help with more of a long-term plan for the patient. Um, and I think some of you already touched on this, but I like to emphasize to the patient that just because we're not eliminating your pain today in the ER, there's still more options. You know, this isn't the, you know, I think people a lot of times get kind of hopeless when you say, this is it, and I can't give you opioids, and now you're just going to kind of live with this pain forever. Um, remind them that, you know, there are still more options. We just need to get them to the right place. We need to get them to PT or to what have you in order to help with their pain reduction by other manners other than just by pills. I also think documenting whatever you've discussed, so if you've made a referral to pain management, you know, if you called and made the appointment like Dr. Silverberg did, or it, I think documenting what you've set up, because then if they didn't follow it on you know, exactly. following visits, because this has been going on for And it goes for back to the years. idea of like documenting the, the concrete things, like yeah. we did this, we discussed this, instead of maybe just putting like <laughs> seeking behavior. So what does that mean? Unhelpful. Well, like, yeah. Explain what it is so then people in the future will know. Because then I try to ask them, well, how did that appointment go that I made you last week? Oh, mm, bummer. Should, are we gonna, what are we doing now? What's your yeah. next plan? You know, to, you know, be consistent. Definitely. And not give up on them. Um, so where are we now? The, the wheels have changed. They turn slowly, especially at a government level. Um, there are those that are calling for official policy changes and removal of this fifth vital sign. It will take time. Um, this is a recent quote from the Vice President of the Joint Commission saying the Joint Commission standards require that patients be assessed for pain and if they are experiencing pain then it should be managed. The standards do not require the use of drugs to manage a patient's pain and when a drug is appropriate the standards do not specify which drug should be prescribed. Um, I kind of think the quote is a little, it's a little defensive sounding on the, the part of the Joint Commission. Um, then again, you know, the Joint Commission, they never sought to create these problems. Everything that was initially done, it was done with good intentions. And not to mention this policy, you know, this isn't the only thing to be blaming for the opioid epidemic. And I think probably for the near future, the, the pain scales are already pretty Okay, so 
we've spoken a lot about uh, drugs of abuse, how common it is, we need to be vigilant, we need to stop the cycle, but um, I kind of want to talk about the other side, and those are the patients with pain who aren't seeking. So we're going to have a little story time. Um, it's 1971, and you can tell it's 1971 from the killer sideburns. And um, my dad here was a sophomore junior at college. He had been recruited to Dartmouth as a gymnast. He was someone who was healthy and athletic. Um, he was used to kind of a fair amount of physical pain because of his heavy training uh, schedule, because of the sport he played. And he first presented to the doctor in 1971. He went to the university clinic and he was complaining of this persistent lower back pain. So they hospitalized him because that's just what they did in the 70s apparently. And he got x-rays, a laminogram, they gave him some Valium, and they basically discharged him and said, you know, it's musculoskeletal pain and it's stress. Don't worry about it. But for the next three years, it just got worse. It was getting worse and worse. He kept going back and they kept treating him with Valium and basically saying there was nothing wrong. Always kind of saying it was stress, you know. Oh, well, midterms are coming up. It's the stress. Or finals are coming up. Or graduation is coming up. And he said that, quote, no one took me seriously. So he decided he was going to kind of figure this out a little more on his own. And he found someone he worked with whose father was a neurosurgeon. So in 1974, three years later, he saw this neurosurgeon, he got hospitalized again, and they finally did a lumbar myelogram. Because remember, there's, you know, there's no MRI at this point. The initial one they did had um, some abnormal findings that they really just didn't know what to make of, so they repeated it, and again, it was abnormal. It showed something concerning for some nerve root tumors. But he was just happy that someone was actually listening to him and doing something at this point. So he had surgery with a L4 and L5 laminectomy and removal of some scar tissue. And during that time, they biopsied what they thought was the arachnoid membrane, kind of just part of the routine surgical process of all this scar tissue and everything. And he had significant improvement, actually, for a few days. Um, shortly before he was going to be discharged, he sneezed, and he tore open his stitches, and he started leaking CSF out of his back. So, they went back to the OR, and at that time, they, they closed the dura, what, which had been leaking. So, short time, doing pretty well, but then the pain, it just it began to worsen. It was getting worse and worse, and he was going back to this neurosurgeon, and the neurosurgeon basically said, we found your problem, we did the surgery, um, you have hereby been cured, and I will not be seeing you anymore. So he was pretty at the end of his rope at this point. Um, he had been young, he was healthy, he was an athlete, and now for three years he had this like debilitating pain. So he, he did something that actually truly makes me cringe. Um, but he went to the lobby of the Dartmouth Hitchcock Hospital, and he basically refused to leave and someone, until someone from higher up came down to speak to him. So somehow the director of neurosurgery agreed and gave up his lunch hour and decided to talk to him. And they talked about his symptoms and they looked at his imaging and this, the surgeon was actually concerned enough that he, he sent him to Boston the next day for another opinion. So he packed up his medical file, everything was paper, drove down to Boston, it was a pretty painful drive, stopping with the pain, saw this other doctor, turned around, drove back to New Hampshire, and then got a call the next day that they both agreed he really needed, he needed some emergent surgery and they needed to explore what was going on more. So they went back in and they did an exploratory surgery. It turns out he had um, almost a foot long arachnoid diverticula in his spine. Uh, that biopsy that they had previously taken was actually part of this large diverticulum. And the only reason, the reason he felt better with that CSF leak was because it was leaking and removing the, the pressure. So he basically had been living with a large mass in his spine. He'd been living with a partial cord compression for a couple of years, and no one took him seriously. It was an odd story, for sure, and it was weird enough to warrant this case report. <laughs> um, but his, his life changed after that surgery. Having that last doctor actually believe him, it, it changed everything. He, his pain basically resolved. 
He had a non-issue, and he went back to being like a normal 20-something. Um, you know, I, I was asking my dad about it for this, and he said they had they had me pegged as a malingerer for three years before someone finally ordered the myelogram. He described his, his tat him as sad, he said it was like hell, um, and then everything changed finally when someone took him seriously. And about 20 years later, he was kind of, I forget why, he was up in New Hampshire for something, and he kind of looked across and he was like, oh my god, that's that surgeon, that last one that finally took me seriously. And he went up to him and kind of recounted the story, and the guy remembered because of the case report and everything. But, you know, my point is, is that patients don't forget things like that, and what you do, it matters. And I, I think this is the point I want to emphasize the most, despite spending all this time on these slides about addiction and drug seeking, that you can't forget the actual patient. You know, when you hear hoofbeats, sometimes it is a zebra. And at the end of the day, you just, you have to use your best judgment. You can't become so cynical that you miss the real pain patient. You gotta, you have to treat pain appropriately, but try not to get duped or, you know, give in to the wrong patient. And this is truly where the art of being a physician matters. So, back to our objectives here. We spoke about how we got here, what pain was, what addiction was, and who the seeking patient was, and who the pain patients are. Um, you know, I, I kind of wanted to tie this up into some, like, nice bow for everyone for our conclusion, but the reality <laughs> is, is that it's, it's, it's complicated and it's messy. So all I can really say is, you know, don't not treat the patients that need it, but don't reflexively order that controlled substance. Thank you to my amazing class. I know you've all been looking at the same photo of us outside Barbagitos from four years ago, so I am proud to be the first one to post this from graduation instead. Questions?
So it makes it a little bit more difficult. But it's just the thing about, there's a lot of new research out there and stuff we don't even know about that we should. I think it's a shorter acting drug than a lot of the narcotics we have, so I don't see it offering that much help. Um, it's going to possibly create a new addiction that's even harder to get to. So I'm not sure it's a great solution. I think that everybody loves it, it does most respiratory pressure, but I'm not sure it's the greatest idea. Yeah. You said that about narcotics too?
to him so many times. Is the number needed to treat that is reasonable? I mean, if, if one out of 20 or one out of 20 is all of us, we can prove one right. These are young lives that... So, I can tell by a watch how destructive it is to enjoy the job. If they all walk with backwards and they use them to do that. Do you know what's exactly? It is a practice. We're not going to be able to do that. I'm going to like this. It makes sense.